I shall crack us off then. Don't have balls. Hello and welcome to the Undercut Podcast. We are back one more time this season, relatively, and we are going to be reviewing the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. I am one of your hosts, as always, Tima Albus Daily, and I'm joined once again by my two excellent co-hosts, Jesse Billington and Ellie Mae Taylor. How are you both? Sad. Why are you sad, Ellie Mae? Because we've no longer got Sebastian Vettel in F1, nor Danny Rick. Mick Schumacher hasn't got a seat. It's, it's sad just, times. It's sad times indeed. Yeah. Mm. How are you, Jesse? Yeah, Please, I'm, say I'm, you're less, let's say you're happier. I'm doing fine. I'm, uh, busy Monday, relatively nonplussed. It's been a nice weekend. Sat at home, watched a lot of racing on the telly. Just, just, just average, really. It's been one of those weekends where I finally haven't had something on, so it's quite nice in that regard. Done a lot of shopping online because sales and stuff. But yeah, how about you? We don't usually ask you how you are. I'm pretty good. I'm quite uh, seat back of this season, to be honest with you. It's uh, it's been a long old season, and uh, I'll probably be pining for the season next year if it's uh, anything to go by of what we can expect, and it's going to be even longer. So we'll try not to focus on that instead. Move swiftly on away from my absolute optimism for 2023. Well, it's already three months and eleven days till it lights out, so I mean it's not too bad. And we are joined by special guest for this week's episode, Manana Mana Two. How are you? Hi, T. All good, and you? Yeah, Such pretty an exciting good, thank you. final race of the season. Yeah, it was uh, more dramatic than we were probably expecting it to be, considering a few years worthy of Abu Dhabi results. So we can get straight into it, I think. And uh, we'll segue straight into what the hell has happened, which I feel it's only right if we have a Mexican on this episode to talk about the Mexican that made the debut in Formula One in Free Practice One with Pato Award. What did you think of it? Wow. I mean, I am so happy for him. And I he was one of the drivers that I wanted to meet the most in my life. And I actually got to meet him after the Mexican Grand Prix. I sure, yes. went to have yeah. I went to have dinner to a restaurant and we were waiting, you know, in line to access the restaurant and he was right behind us so I just took a picture with him I talked a little bit and then they just got us all in at the same time but I'm so happy for him like I just really do expect to see him in Formula One eventually and I actually told him that that day and he said hmm we'll see what happens maybe one or two years and I was like you better I'm going to say those 2026 regulations seem like the perfect chance for him to come in, no? If uh, you want a fresh chance at uh, getting in the McLaren seat or maybe Andretti if they're around by then. Yeah, exactly. I mean, even, even Audi, I mean, I don't know. But I really True. think Audi might bring Mick Schumacher, if I'm honest with you. I'm going to say, see what we can make happen to see that we get all our favourite drivers back on the grid. So <laughs> just need to, need to wait and exactly. see. We've got a few years to plan this out properly, haven't we? A hundred percent. And for them to mature as well as drivers. Yes, yes, definitely. It's, uh, again, see what happens with Lando and Oscar next year and see how many fireworks we get between those. And maybe it would be best if we have com- two completely new drivers come 2026. Who knows? A hundred percent. Other drivers that were also racing in FP1, it was a lot of them, were Liam Lawson, Felipe Drogovic, Robert Schwartzman, Robert Kubica, Logan Sargent, Jack Doon, and Audi. Which one of you wants to take on those bunch of names? Jesse, Ellie May, preference? Um, I'll start with what I know, and I'll start with Liam Lawson and B5, which I've just realised makes it sound like I know him personally. I don't. Nice chat by all accounts, but I haven't actually met him. Um, but yeah, he didn't do too badly, did he? If anything, he sort of rather humbled um, Sergio Perez in the Red Bull seats with some fairly feisty performances on some uh, just competitive times, really, just showing that he once he's got his grips with that car, he could be quite fast and certainly one to make Sergio Perez look over his shoulder, or at least Yuki Sonoda or Nick De Vries if they aren't performing to the top of their abilities in that Alpha Tauri. I mean, Drogovic, a bit underwhelming in P20 in the Aston Martin. It's a bit of a tricky car to drive. A lot, um, this is his first and, time in the car, though, properly yeah. on the weekend. He's first only just time. got a super license. Mm. 
Yeah, it gives them some due at some points, and at the same time, it, yeah, tricky car to drive. Mixed reviews there. I was hoping for a bit better. Um, Pato Award obviously already mentioned that again. It's a very different car to what he's used to driving, so P eighteen isn't hugely to be on sort of surprised at. Robert Schwartzman again, pretty strong performance from the now Israeli driver um, P seven. So pretty pretty decent drive from him there in the Ferrari. Again, putting it up there with the other Ferraris out on track. So it's. It's good. Again, good reason for him to be sort of sticking around the Ferrari factory as their sort of test driver. Robert Kubica a P14. Nothing much to write home there. Logan Sargent P15. Pretty decent, to be fair. Didn't look too shabby. He was up against Albon on track, I want to say. Yes. Yeah. And again, Albon looked pretty quick through some of the early practice sessions. But again, he's well bedded into that seat and a lot more experience. So Sergeant's P15, not wholly shocking. Jack Dewan's P19, again, sort of puts him into the same boat as Drugovic and P20. So only a second he's got time, more time in, in his seat. side, though, to be fair, in terms of getting used to that. And he should be getting more sessions in that car next year, if anything. Is yeah, he's away got from a- his F2 performances. Yeah, he's got a bit more time to sort of get used to the chassis and get used to the way that the current F1 cars drive compared to the F2 cars. And then there's Pietro Fittipaldi, P17, who has had a fair amount of seat time in that Haas across the year. He's done a few test sessions, obviously does a lot of development work back at the factory farm as well. I think it just speaks to just how sort of tricky that Haas can be at times. So mixed bag, but some stellar reports, especially for Lawson and Schwartzman. Uh, they're definitely the two standouts mm. for me. Which does lead us into some news that is not going to be too surprising, but still makes Eddie May sad all the same. There was news out of Haas earlier this week. Yeah, Haas have decided to get rid of Mick Schumacher for Nico Hulkenberg, which I'm really happy to have Nico Hulkenberg back. I wanted Have Hulkenberg you seen him in the suit? <laughs> mm. He I looks haven't. great. He looks, he, he he looks, looks like, like if Mick Schumacher said Shazam and then just grew about 10 feet. <laughs> it's just if, if Mick Schumacher matured. Yeah. yeah. It's him in the later years. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but... As much as I love Nico Hulkenberg, I don't think I wanted it at this expense of Mick Schumacher. I think it's. I think Hass's reasoning is a bit harsh in that they're saying they want someone with more experience, and it's some one that I don't really understand because yes, Nico has the experience, I guess, because he's been in Formula One longer. But Mick's actually driven their Hass car for. I'm not counting 2020, so we, 2021. Sorry, so he's. He's got a I suppose the logic over. I'm using yeah. there is that Holcomb, if you look at Magnussen, had a year out, jumped straight in and was able to do pretty well, at least in the first half of the season, and has done decently enough in the second half of the season with what he's got available. You can see the appeal of having a more experienced driver there. And it goes back to, for me, trying to be a little cold about it maybe which you won't be a fan of but um because we all love Mick Schumacher let's not be mistaken that very nice guy but if you took the results from the past two years oh 2021 is a bit unfair but if you took it from this season you gave it to a different driver would you be sad to see a driver with those results go and the answer is probably not Yes, maybe that warrants you giving another go. I mean, it's curious that Sonoda, for example, gets a third year with how bad he's been this year, if you look at it across the season. He's had some flash-in-the-pan moments, but for a second year in F1, it's not been the improvement anyone would have wanted there. So that's been surprising in some ways. So I just wonder, if we didn't like Mick so much, would we be as annoyed if he was someone else? I think Mick Schumacher, okay, he's crashed a lot, but then Leclerc's crashed. Verstappen's crashed in his early years. I mean, obviously it's a lot more expensive for Haas because they aren't a big team like Red Bull or Ferrari. But he's had some real standout performances. If you think Austria, he fought Lewis Hamilton and he fought him for a while. And then Silverstone, he fought Max for his first points of the of the year so, or ever. Those were some good moments, but I think the problem with Silverstone, it was good because it translated into points, but Austria, if I remember correctly, didn't. And while it was good to see the fighting, it's 
still going to come down to right or wrongly to what the end result is. And if you're looking to to just make decisions based off the data, then it doesn't do him any favors. So it's like you might be very good at fighting on track, but if you can't make that stick against, because obviously he wasn't going to win the majority of the time against the Red Bull or Mercedes in that house. But if he can't do that against the lesser quality cars, for lack of a better phrase there, then it does put him in a sticky position. And I do think he'll be back, but it's I can't I can't blame Haas as much as I'd like Mick for making this decision. And Hulkenberg, it's going to be interesting to see because he has been out of it properly for a little while. He's been in and out and in and out and shaking it all about. But it's going to be interesting to see what he can do there. And I kind of hope it works out for them because then maybe K-Mag leaves and is replaced by Mick and we get Hulkenberg and Mick. Who knows? But what I will say is this, the idea you said about taking his results and transposing them onto another team, if you took them for, say, another, another driver in the same another car. Another driver in a similar car. Yeah, if you, or, for example... Or literally if you look the at, same car. Look, same. If you look at Antonio Giovinazzi last year, or Kimi Raikkonen last year, decent results every now and then, a few points, at the most four, I think, was the most any of them, either of those two achieved last year. Possibly six or eight for Kimi. And again, it's in a car that has its moments of decency, but again, compared to the field it's up against, you'd expect a bit more with the drivers you've got, you'd expect a bit more. Again, just because you like Antonio Giovinazzi, because you like Kimi Raikkonen, doesn't immediately give them a pass. And I think... I was going to say, I was wondering where you were going with that example, because I did want to point out where are they on the grid this year, Jesse? So I was yeah, like, they're not like, on the grid. That's a defence no, for them to stay there. No, like, this, isn't, this wasn't a defence. This is, more of a, this is okay. more of a backing up on your point of the idea of it's yeah, unusual you put, for you to do that. So yeah, that's I, why know, I, I can understand sure. why you're a bit shocked <laughs> that I'm sort of coming to your side on this. But the idea that you take a, a liked driver, one that has a sort of a cult of personality, a cult of following to them, and you give them those results, all of a sudden you go, mm, yeah, probably it's time for you to leave. And I think the same applies to your Kimi Raikkonen in, in that instance as much as it does to your Mick Schumacher. Yeah, nice guy, perfectly amicable. Nothing against them personally. But when you're looking for a racing driver, someone to bring home the bacon in a season where there have been a lot of fights in the Constructors' Championship, which is where the teams are really focusing because that's where the money is, which is what the teams are in this for. They're in this for the prize money. Let's not forget that. Crown of Glory, yeah, it's nice to say you won everything, but you're in it for the big dollars. And you look at how much Alfa Romeo threw into this to try and cling on to, what, sixth place by the end of the season? Really strong drive. They were fighting Aston Martin to the bitter end you've got to really weigh up just how much you like a driver versus how productive a driver is actually going to be. And I think that's possibly what Haas have had to do here and go as much as we like Mick and as much as he is easy to work with. At the same time, he is A, expensive, the most expensive driver on the grid when it comes to crashes and writing off cars, and B, possibly not as productive as Hulkenberg could be. And they've obviously Which is also at- something I feel that Aston Martin should have a good line hard to think about in terms of just because you like someone doesn't mean you should keep them around. Just no hints about who that could be. Just because they're blood doesn't mean they should be sticking around. But again, the, the, I think one of the things to bear in mind with Hulkenberg is you look at his performances against Stroll earlier on this season. He was pretty competitive against him despite having no seat time. And again, the same when he jumped into the racing point in 2020. Again, mm-hmm. very little seat time against... He was replacing Stroll. He replaced both point. of them at one point. At both points, yeah. And again, at both points, he proved to be brilliantly competitive this idea that you can plonk him into a car that he's had very little seat time in and he will do a pretty decent performance compared to that car's benchmark around that circuit wherever you are and I think Haas have realised that that is an ability that they might be able to foster they realise they aren't great at fostering young talent they've seen that with obviously trying to get the man who shall not be named and Mick Schumacher through there is no there. helping some drivers that must be said as well yeah but at the same time they, they've they proven they haven't got this ability to foster talent and if you wind the clock back to who was their first driver alongside Roman Grosjean when they started Marcus Ericsson not Marcus Ericsson uh, he what? was at Sauber um, Mexican driver I want to say Gutierrez was it Esteban Gutierrez yes wow, I was going to say he's gone into Formula E these days and isn't doing too badly he drives a Porsche I think um, would need a Formula E. Gutierrez? Hmm. Yeah. I think you're thinking of Pascal Berlin. Could be. <laughs> I can't remember who um, Esteban Gutierrez drives for these days. Because but... either he looks like him or he looks like Andre Lotterer, and I tell you now, he doesn't look like Andre Lotterer. <laughs> no. 
anyway, the fact of the matter is that they had Gutierrez in the seat. He was a relatively young driver. They don't have the facilities and the team structure to foster a young talent coming through, which is why they did all right when they had their Grosjeans, their Magnussons, and that's why they went back to a Magnusson and why they're looking at bringing in an established talent they don't have to foster and guide. So I think it's a, it's a two-pronged thing for Haas, and as sad as it is, it makes a lot of sense when you need that dollar. I would, I'd still say I disagree in the sense that she's not at that point of grief yet, where it's acceptance. She's still in denial. Which I'm still in denial, but I don't think you can count Mick's first year because he was technically driving a 2020 car in 2021. So this is Mm. technically his first year in F1. Rovers have been kicked out or demoted for less than a season's work, though. But if you compare him to Latifi, who's been in this sport for three years who would you say I didn't say, I didn't say it was fair I'm just saying I mean okay you, should, you, you bully on the TV but let's not forget Stroll he should have been gone years ago let's not even let's not have that one so I'm going to defend the TV much harder than <laughs> Stroll before we get there so but anyway I have a my first fun fact slash question of the Oh, it was you who wrote that. Yeah. Yeah. It's Ellie May's question but time. If Nico Hulkenberg hadn't rejoined F1, then there would be no dri- German driver on the grid for next year. When was the last time there was no German on the F1 grid? Pre Michael Schumacher, so I want to say 95. <sighs> you can shake your head or not, sorry. No, There's going to be a German on the grid pre 95. I'm going to go. Yeah, I'm this. saying maybe there wasn't for one year. It doesn't need to be. You, for like you do ever. know if you go for '95, didn't Michael Schumacher win in '94? I was trying to figure out when he first started. He was going something. for a ballpark figure. He's he's getting warmed up here for the quizzing. Um, '92, then there we go. '87. Who's closest? What did what did you, you said '87? Timo said '92. Timo's closer. Damn it! Yeah, just. Uh, 1990. Michael Schumacher joined in 1991. And I forget he was there that early, Benetton. It was just such a long time. Mm. But you think of, and I have like, you think of Germany now being such a powerhouse for drivers. But before Schumacher, there was no real successful German driver in F1. And in the 41 years before Michael Schumacher joined F1, the most successful driver was Wolfgang von Trips, who came second in 1961. So I'm glad you came out with that because well. I was about so to yeah, Google that. that. <laughs> yeah, you don't know Wolfgang that... von Trips? Yeah. No, I know Wolfgang von Trips, but I was, I was waiting for her to sort of finish off the statement because there was a bit of my brain going, surely there must have been a German F1 driver before Schumacher. I was sort of going, oh, yeah. there, were, there were obviously German drivers before But not successful Schumacher, ones, yeah. Not so... really successful. Trips was he what second in a championship or just second in a race? Was that second in a championship oh, in right. 1961? Hmm. Who did you drive for? Best of the rest. Oh, drive tribe article oh. for me, part two of that series. I don't know. Oh, right. We're going to have to find out now. Wolf <laughs> gang von trips. For those of you who are attending our big quiz, um, take note. <laughs> Championships nil, wins two, podium six, career points fifty six, pole positions one. And yeah, we're off with a team. He that is came, my story. I'm getting to it. The long way down the Wikipedia page. He Scroll came second Wikipedia. in 1961, driving we for Ferrari. Ah. Oh, he was in the really pretty Ferrari as well, the one five six, the shark nose one mm-hmm. with the double grill slots at the front. So does Beautiful. that mean then? It'll be next year will be the first time in is my maths correct in saying 33 years that we don't have a Schumacher or a Vettel on the grid? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because obviously we had Schumacher arrived on the grid in 91. 91. And we've had always had a Vettel to bridge it in the gap yeah. between the Schumachers as well. So yeah, 91 through present day is yeah, 31 years. Yeah. Three years. 33, 31. I don't, it's too late in the evening to try and do math. <laughs> 20. Well, it's 1990 to 2023, 19. which is 33, no? Oh, 2022, take 
1991 is 32 i think i just did it's 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 about 30 years or so and since we last had a grid with no schumacher or uh vettel on it so there you are there's your statistic we'll probably calculate that for if we decide to hold a big pub quiz when we need to pull that question up um anyway getting um, back to the grand prix Yes. Max Verstappen won his 15th Grand Prix of the season with Leclerc in P2, which is always good for these days by look of things, and Checo in P3, which the amusing fact that I put down before LMA got there was that Checo's podium tally for 2022 matches the record for all his past seasons combined. So in some ways, a victory for him. In other ways, weird. Um, Only his seven past seasons of sport. I'm pretty certain he got it but doesn't balance if you include unless I've missed one of his podiums for this year for whatever reason because I I'm think just going been... off what Sky said which to be fair they could be wrong because they are a lot these days and it's... this is a perfect place to call them out on welcome to live fact checking Sky Sports F1 right I mean, I wouldn't go to Sky Sports F1 to fact check the fact that I got no, we're, Sky Sports we're F1 fact if checking. they're wrong. We're actively fact checking them with some facts from a different site. Anyway, so, what's your fun fact while he does his research? The top three finished the last race in the order that they finished the Drivers' Championship. When was the last time this happened? In just, like, so, so at some point at the final race of the 2016. season. 2016. So in the final race... That yeah. Was the last okay. Time just so I go to check the final race. Okay. Yes. Uh, and I will see. give you a clue on this in that it before 2011 because in both Ooh. 20 because in 2013 and 2011 we had the top three drivers in the championship on the final podium but not in the right order. Not in the right order. So in 2013 in Brazil, uh, it was special win followed by Weber and Alonso. I want to say 2009 then. No. Okay. 1976. 2007. You're close. Oh, no, it's going to be 2006. 2008, isn't it, Kimmy? No. No? Six. No. Five. Five. No. Five. Four. 2005, Five. really? 2005, China, Alonso, Raikkonen, Schumacher. Oh. What the hell was China the last race for? No, it, the last... it was. Yeah, no, because no, remember with Hamilton... 2005, no. <laughs> no, because <laughs> Not no, then. I remember in... it because when Alonso had his old uh, Renault out, but uh, Abu Dhabi two seasons ago, it mm. still had the China steering rack and China track map in the cockpit because it was the last car they had from the season, so it was easiest to pull out. Trust you to remember that. It's a weird statistic. So 2022, Sergio Perez has scored 11 podiums across his career. He scored 26, which means that there's he's scored not quite half of them this year which means well, Sky screwed up somewhere so yes. I'll blame Crofty for that and we can move swiftly on I was going to say uh, I calculated that's 26 other things. podiums yeah 26 podiums across his career most of that must have been last year surely a lot of those came last year yeah um, last year he did he scored one, two, three, four, five, five, only five podiums last year actually Jesus yeah but if you go back across his previous to seven years, so 2021, 2020, 19, 18, 17, 16, and so forth, back to cover seven of them, that, that's how long it takes you to go back in his career and score 11 podiums. Bear in mind, in his second season, he scored three podiums, 2012 with Sauber. Hmm. He was, he's, he's never been a, a terrible driver. We never accused him of being a terrible driver, to be fair. No, but again... No. Overlooked and over underrated is always an easy way. He did get slept on for a while. For a good while, yeah. I don't think his bad spell at McLaren helped things, to be fair. No. If I were you, Ellie May, I wouldn't say that to Max's mum. She'd get ideas. Anyway, uh, we'll move on from the sort of results of the race matching the po- the, uh, the the season results. Um, we've already mentioned... Uh, yeah, here's a fun statistic from the race. Uh, first year where neither Seb nor Lewis have been P2 in the championships. Apparently someone else has a fun fact for this one. I do. It's the Ellie May trilogy of fun facts for the news. It I like is. this. This can stay as a, as a section. <laughs> it's Hamilton's worst year since he's been in F1. <sighs> have you been P6. reading the rest of the script? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Before that, what was his worst driver's Standing in the driver's standing position. So there are two years where he gets the same 
position. I want to say 2013. No, I've deemed one worse than the other, which I'll give my reason for once you guess the years or positions. 2010. No. 2011. Yes, that's one of them. 2011, he was beaten by Button, wasn't he? Yep. At McLaren. 2012. Is. 2012. Nope. You sure? Mm -hmm. 2009, then. Yes. Yeah, 2009 where it was Braun, wasn't it? Again, beat yeah, by Button. 2009 and 2011, he came fifth, but I've deemed 2011 worse because Button was second, or Hamilton was fifth, which makes it the biggest gap between him and a, him being behind a teammate in a championship. Mm. And then 2009, again, he came fifth, but Heike Kovalainen came 12th. So he did better. Might have to think There's a reason we forgot about him last week on the podcast. Let's face it. <laughs> yeah, it's mad to think that Heike Kovalainen was once his teammate. Might have to think. Yeah, I, I didn't yeah. realize that. He's he's like a pointless answer. No, not not Catron McLaren. Oh, yeah, he's like a pointless answer in a way. Heike Kovalainen, poor guy. If you're listening to this, sorry. <laughs> sorry, you're welcome to come on the podcast. I'm sure you're lovely. We'd love to have you on and chat. It'd be fantastic to know what it's like being Lewis Hamilton's teammate as well. Um, anyway, yeah, so we had the race. We saw the race. We'll talk more about that, I guess, when we get to winners and spinners. A fun thing that happened after the race was Nick de Vries was thrown in the harbour at the end of the race, given a beer and zip tied to a tyre trolley to be delivered to Alpha Tauri by the Mercedes mechanics. And I just think that's fun. It's a really light-hearted, funny side of Formula One that you just don't tend to get from this sort of high-tech clinical sport that at the end of it, they go a bit rogue and just throw a guy in a marina and then cable tie into a piece of equipment. That happens at least once a year in Abu Dhabi at this time of year, though. <laughs> Yeah, it does. F1, I should say. I'm not I'm not going into criminal stuff there. F1 related. It usually happens with the mechanics, but you very rarely see it in the drivers. But I think it's nice in the fact that De Vries was on board with it and laughing and it wasn't like in a sense that they're just bullying him. They're just bullying him because he's small. No, it, I think, again, it shows how much of a key element to the team has been or how much of a, a significant presence he's been at the Mercedes team across the year and the relationship he's got with the mechanics, with the team. It's obviously, he's ingratiated, ingratiated himself well there. And also, it's nice that they threw him in and then zip-tied him to the tire trolley as opposed to zip-tied him to an inanimate object and then threw him in with it. Um, interestingly... This is, the, this is not the Sopranos. This is no. the one. Uh, we'll, we'll outfit him with a with a tire trolley pair of shoes um they did the same thing to i want to say sam bird in formula e when he swapped teams to jaguar they zip tied him to a trolley doused him in water and then covered him in eggs and flour uh wheeled him round to jaguar the jaguar set him free and then he had to walk back to his old team to do a race debrief <laughs> so you had to sit there stinking like a slightly undercooked cake and do this debrief and then finish, then head back off to Jaguar, which is quite funny. But yeah, it's 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 nice to see this sort of fun side of things. And there was all sorts of people being thrown in the marina and having a good laugh, which is good. It essentially doesn't pay if you're small. No, you're easy to be picked up and thrown around. <laughs> and you fit on a tyre trolley quite neatly as well like in, the, in this instance as well. Watch um, out, you What I'm saying is Ellie May, watch out when we go into the pub quiz. <laughs> <laughs> if Ellie May swaps to a different podcast, like if she joins the Pit Stop Boys, <laughs> we're going to have to zip tie her to God. a trolley and like <laughs> deliver her to them. Screw you for joining the Checkered Flag podcast, Ellie May, just wheeling her off to Jenny Gallagher. could house. turn into the Sopranos if she goes over there, to be fair. <laughs> what, if she goes to the Pit Stop Boys or the Checkered Flag? Oh, the Pit Stop Boys. Checkered Flag, I don't know enough about them to be against them just yet. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, you... Perhaps I want to brush up on them. I've invited Jenny Gow, Jack Nichols, and um, I'm trying to get hold of Jolian Palmer to see if they want to come to the quiz as well. Oh, I know who they are. That's okay, then. We yeah. won't zip tie you and throw you in a room for that. No. Kind. Uh, we treat you well. Um, another fun fact, actually. We're packing this section with some fun facts relating to the brace. Uh, this makes this isn't sense. really news, is it? This is just fact for a round, isn't it? But there's not. It, everyone knows what happened. It was a bit of a non-plus race, really. Everything had been wrapped up by this point. Um... 17 we out of 20. Fact. We do love a fun fact. Everyone loves a fun fact. Um, 17. Just saying, we need to read the section. Time for the fact. Um, 17 of 22 race wins for Red Bull this season, 15 of those for Max. Only five races where he hasn't been on the podium. And none of them were really down to him or his error, which is quite interesting. Although, Timo, you've got a point. Yeah, I, I just really think it's a perfect time to highlight that the 17 race wins for Red Bull, 15 for Max, and only five when he's not been on the podium. What an excellent example of these new regulations working as an absolute charm, I've got to say. Closer racing, maybe, but results-wise, it's 
I really hope this isn't the president that we've got to live with until 2026 because bloody hell, I thought 2013 was dull. I will take that and be very happy with it at this point because, whew. Well, the racing was good. The results don't reflect it because Ferrari, it was good. And it's the results that matter. If you have great results, if you have great racing, you don't give a shit. Yeah, but the fact is, Ferrari cocked up a lot, and that that skewed the results. Verstappen and Hamilton, could he win the race? No, he couldn't. So, does it matter? Not really. He still wants to see. If he'd won the race on both of those occasions, we'd have been having some great times. No, no. Yeah, I. We, I guess, it would have been closer if Ferrari hadn't been Ferrari. You don't want to just have one other team because then you're just swapping Mercedes out for Ferrari. That's what I mean. It's still. It's still like the top three are still the top three, and the rest are the middle, and mm-hmm. that's like nothing really in reality has changed. It's been a revolutionary year, it really has. That's all I wanted to say. That I felt like that should go well with your fun fact. That's all. It's rather undercut the fun fact. Her name it's in the spirit of the podcast. Yeah, um, <laughs> but like it's true at the same time. But it, it's impressive the dominance that Red Bull have been able to assert coming into the season. I think as well. And that's referred to in literally any of the year. <laughs> yeah, it would have been nice to have a bit more of a Not title. The one fight. that's been touted as for the last two years is this is going to change everything, and it kind of did, but not in the way we wanted. It changed everything. It made Max Verstappen world champion for a worse. second time, and yeah, made everything worse. It's like that Richard Hammond sound on TikTok. Where he's like, oh, I'll try this. Oh, no, that's not done anything. <laughs> um, it's, it's weird considering that, okay, in 2020, Lewis Hamilton for sure was going to win the championship, and we definitely knew that, but it produced more race winners. Mm. In a shorter season, but there's yeah. less opportunity yeah. for it. <laughs> that's a bit bonkers. Mm. And this year, we didn't even have like a wild race winner. I don't even think no. I could call George the Russell. The most wild, wild thing you got was Lando on the podium in Imola, and that was because everyone was stuck in a DRS train and Charles cocked up. Yeah, and even then, Lando yeah. had won at Imola before. Like, we know he's got form around the circuit. I mean, he's won Imola before, oh, right? Yeah. 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 He's not won there. Not won there. He's podium there before, <laughs> sorry. You, you can tell I've had a busy day. Um, yeah, like, last year we had, obviously, Ocon winning. The year before we had Gasly winning. We had, last year, hell, we had Sergio Perez winning in a racing point in 2020. And a double um, racing point Renault podium, podium and yeah, Renault podiums and all sorts. Like we had interesting stuff, and this year we just haven't had that. It's been the same seven people on the top step of, on the podium. It's not really been that fun. But anyway, that's more of a yeah, season seven. review. Well, I was thinking it's mainly the same six, and then that. Yes, it's I'm one anomaly. Of, one. one anomaly, but <laughs> the statistic is correct. The phrasing isn't. Anyway, that's all us getting into more of a rant about 2022 and more of a season review sort of thing. So, Timo, have you got anything else to add before we get into our winners and spinners section as well? I want to just get your thoughts as a whole on the race and just a little touch on what have you thought of the season so far? Sorry, the season so far. The season's finished now. What am I talking about? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, the season was really exciting. Last season was more dramatic, I feel, because of this whole rivalry, but nothing much happened during the season. Everything was just really focused on Max Verstappen and Lewis Hamilton. This season gave us so many surprises, so many MVPs, I would say. Like last season, I, for me, it was Carlos Sainz and Lando Norris, the MVPs. Mm. And this season, George Russell is definitely one of them. But then we also have Charles Leclerc. We have Checo Perez. Like, there's so many MVPs this season because so much was happening during almost all of the races. As in for today's race, in a way, it was 90% more exciting than last season's because last season's was kind of boring. Just that final lap was what got yeah. us all going like, <gasps> wow, this was one of the best races of the season, but it wasn't. This one was at least in my top five. I really, really liked everything that was happening. And like, I love Max Verstappen. I love Checo Perez, but you can tell that they kind of like got him in this place. You know, Max Verstappen after Brazil. We don't really know what happened behind the scenes, but I can, like, we could tell today that he was just like, okay okay tell Checo Perez to like speed up the tires are fine this and that whatever 
And I think that if Checo Perez were ever close enough to him and he needed to give that position, he would have done so at least today. But, well. I mean, if I wanted to play devil's advocate with you, I could very much say that Max has won the championship, much like he had in Brazil already. There was nothing really for him to gain. He could have just let him go by in turn one and then just defended hard for him like Checo did for him last year. But who, what, who, I do what do I know? <laughs> no, I absolutely agree. But he's just extremely competitive. And yeah. I think that Racing it's drivers. more... Yeah, exactly. More than like him not wanting to help his teammate, I think he doesn't want to be seen like a softy more like that like hey i don't think he'll ever get accused of that but i know what you mean yeah yeah yeah. like i'm a beast like nobody can beat me and i think that has a lot to do with how his dad raised him if i'm honest with you no i'd say so definitely so we're gonna go into winners and spinners now and Ladies first, guess first with you again, Manena. Who do you think was your winner from the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix? Well, Max, obviously, no, but the real <laughs> winner. <laughs> Easy job winner. done next. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, the real winner for me was Jacques Leclerc, um, especially because Chico Perez did overtake him for a while. And even like, I feel that Jacques Leclerc doesn't really deal very well with pressure, but today proved something different because I don't know if you heard this, but even his team told him eventually we're going to be overtaken. Like for him not to let that happen, which in other races, I think he would have let that get to him for me. That was he was a real winner. Sean Leclerc definitely, I'd say, a, a worthy winner for this race. He put in a good drive, managing a fairly tricky tire strategy as well. So, Timo, you've got a slightly different set of winners, and I suspect for slightly different reasons. Yeah, I mean, it's been no secret that Vettel and Ricardo have had a tough old year in a lot of respect, but uh, for a way to exit the sport, a decent Ricardo's temporarily Vettel will leave a little bit of a dot 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 question mark, and we'll see. Um, they had a nice enough final race as it could be with the tools that they had available to them. Um, I still think Stroll was an absolute bastard for not letting Vettel have a couple more points and overtaking him right towards the end, um, which Vettel was quite vocal about. And it did sound very much on the team rage as if he'd said a bad word for a moment there, uh, but he did not. I don't know if you recall that particular bit of team radio, um, but it very much sounded like how the how the did we manage to do this or how, how did we manage to get behind Stroll for sake something to those um, something similar to that, to that sounding but he just said how are we back here and it was just very similar over the radio crackle there which was quite amusing but yeah no ninth and 10th I think in the end it was for Vettel and Ricardo. point bit of fighting nice bit of tussle between former teammates and I've got a fun fact they may 37 points apiece for both of them, but with Ricardo ahead, just like last time when they were in the, the same team together. Yeah, it's if they had got Vettel's strategy right, one Vettel would then be ahead of Ricardo in the driver's standings, and then Aston Martin would have also then been ahead of Alfa Romeo in the in the constructors. So, yeah, if they'd given Vettel a better strategy, dollars. yeah. If they'd given them a better strategy, Vettel would have finished higher than P10 and would have been, you know, just would have been nice for his last race. But he's still in the points. He gave us a good fight with Ricardo. And he was a bit tasty at other points during the race. It was just fun to see him just, I don't really care. I'm just here for a bit of fun at the end and it'd be, we'll see what we can do about it. It was some classic tier Seb, and I think we also saw like some great moves from Ricardo as well. It was almost like a sort of greatest hits album from the two of them. They knew this is their sort of parting impact on the sport and the way that people will likely remember them. I think they both did well to show quite what we used to think of them, especially when we were watching them at their prime, but sort of highly competitive teams. So it was, yeah, it was definitely an odd one it was nice to see them certainly winners in their own rights for putting on a brilliant performance for driving brilliantly they were both driving the absolute hell out of their cars through the race and I think yeah it's just it's interesting to view it with almost this nostalgia now of knowing the two of them are moving on and we potentially might see neither of them actually in an F1 car racing for the sort of foreseeable future 
Ellie Mae, you've got a similar point, but I suspect it's quite different to Manena's. You've gone for the entire team of Ferrari as a winner. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to congratulate them on having a good strategy because really that's rewarding them for the bare minimum. But I think <laughs> it's best. <laughs> I think it was the Ferrari's best race in a while, in a sense that Mercedes couldn't really match them. And Charles really brought the fight to Perez in such a way that I think whatever Red Bull did, second pit stop or not for Perez, I think Charles would have got Perez because he was catching him at a race, rate of knots after the first lot of pit stops. And I think it just... I don't want to say they were the, definitely the second best team because I think they were a bit more than that in Abu Dhabi because obviously they beat, they beat Perez, but it was... The first time they've kind of in a while that they've really brought the fight to Red Bull, albeit it be just Perez because Max was just Ferrari off beat Perez distance. or Red Bull beat Perez. I think Red Bull beat Perez and Ferrari seized the opportunity to also beat Perez there. I think they, they took on a weakened opponent and sort of claimed it as a win. I think is the best way of viewing it. But there was like I think I like the point you said this is the the feistiest and the strongest we've seen and most competent we've seen Ferrari for a while. And it puts you back in mind of maybe Abu Dhabi, not Abu Dhabi, um, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Australia, those first three rounds of the season were... We can only perform well at desert tracks. <laughs> yeah, we... I don't know. It did remind me very much of um, Charles' P2 in the, in, the, in, the, in the Drivers' Championship of that Top Gear episode where the... Uh, making police cars and Hammond deploys that uh, tarpaulin with the nails through it other than Stig just drives around it it was like ha 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 oh Max still won never you mind know, the sort of thing he made this amazing sort of challenge that's been the entirety of Charles Leclerc's season is that's, that's, that's Ferrari in a nutshell this yeah, year I is think deploying I might put that on our Instagram page yeah. six doormats with nails through them and thinking ha ha we've got Red Bull and Red Bull just simply drives around them and I think that's what Red Bull did for a lot of the races this season but coming into Abu Dhabi, I didn't think they were going to be as competitive as they were. And like, yeah, Ellie May's point of putting them as a winner definitely tallies because they drove and conducted themselves with what they should have done all season long. And I think that is almost worthy of calling them a spinner for being such fucking teases and going, oh, we can do this if we put our minds to it. We're not gonna. Uh, like, why not? It's, uh, it's just crippling. Hey. What about you, Jesse? Uh, not on the side of pain or being or crippling. Um, I've gone for two winners. Cons- considering it's the winners section, I hope. Yes, not. yeah, it's it, it, in the winners section. It is not. It is Esteban Ocon and George Russell. One, I love the fact that when Esty like checks in with his pass at the barriers to get into the paddock, it says Esty Bestie on the monitor. I love the fact that that's they've included that. He knows. He knows. We know. I like that. Uh, but also, he had a pretty good drive from him this weekend. Just pretty, pretty competent nothing extravagant but again just extracting exactly what he needs to be extracted from that car and it puts me in great faith for the coming season that a 523 i think is what the chassis is going to be called next year it's going to be a fairly decent car the development's going pretty well and he's at grips with the team he's at grips with the car the chassis the style of things and as a parting note for this year it's the one we wanted to see from Mesti, and it's a nice finish was he sixth i think ocon finished seventh lando norris finished sixth yeah but anyway, yeah, because yeah. Lando was the best of the rest, which he hates. Mm, he hates sort of coming in that point, but that, that's again been very summative of his season. Um, but yeah, Ocon, decent drive from him, brilliantly competitive, yeah. <laughs> and Excuse me. again showed a great amount of pace and control over the over his teammate. He's one of the few drivers that's ever been able to beat Fernando Alonso in equal machinery. So that's something to hold. And equally, he was a long way ahead of Lance Stroll. Um, Ocon finished 57 seconds behind to the lead fair, car. That's not too difficult. That's not too difficult. Stroll finished in P8, but was 76 seconds. So nearly another, what's that, 30, no, 20 Mass. seconds down the road. And yeah, it's, it's a decent little margin to have pulled out. And again, just shows sort of this this just really strong base level competency that he's performing at, which is nice. And then again, Russell came home in a fairly solid P5. Can't go wrong with that. Again, it's a decent drive. He's shown exactly what he's been showing all season long. Again, when you're looking to leave that one final note at the end of a season, that drive is a really good one. I think it's one of the reasons I overestimated Yuki Sonoda coming into this year was because he finished P4 in Abu Dhabi last year. And I went, 
the kids cracked it. Here we go, boys. <laughs> Yuki Sonoda dominance and then sort of Yuki Sonoda's way through the year instead. At least I'm not alone in thinking Alpha Tari was going to do decently this year. <laughs> yeah, I think I a lot of people I thought they would definitely did. do better, yeah. Yeah, look at where they finished. You'd expect them to have done better, but that strikes me as more of a season review thing for us to get on to. But yeah, I think Ocon who's, and Russell, my winners. Who's got the biggest height difference? Russell and Hamilton or Ocon and Gasly? Because I, I often think, how hard is it to develop a car around drivers that are very different in height? Tall and short. Um, Missed opportunity, Joe Hulkenberg, in the same team. That's all I'm saying. Hmm. Ocon Yuki would be the trickiest driver pairing to try and develop a car round. I th- mm. Yeah. I don't know. That's a question for me to go away and research. Perhaps I'll put it into the quiz, which team for 2022 and 2023 has the greatest driver height difference. If you're listening to this now and attending the quiz, you're going to have an advantage because you'll, you'll just go away and research this. Also, stop you- listening to this and focus on the quiz. What are you doing? Stop cheating. Get yeah, out of so- here. Put your phone down. We said no phones. Anyway, uh, that rounds out our winners. The question is our spinners. Timo, I'll let you open up the spinner section. I won't go into the first one of these too much because I know that the other one on this podcast is myself just want to go into this a bit as well. But Mercedes kind of shot themselves in the foot a little bit, unfortunately. Uh, they did say coming into the weekend that we shouldn't expect more from them from the likes of Brazil uh, but I don't think they were quite expecting to to do quite I, th- I say this badly Brussels still P5 and Hamilton yet yeah, DNF very rare um, and probably a little bit more of that floor damage causing some some trickery and nonsense in the car somewhere else which is unfortunate but uh, yeah dropped the ball a little bit but Red Bull are my other one which seems weird I know because first and third but it kind of follows on from Brazil in that I know it, this is racing and I know that you can't really take the racing out of the racing driver. But once again, considering everything Perez has done for the team and for Max, what was to stop them from just telling Max, let Perez go in front, let's just see what he can, at least give him the chance to pull out a lead and you for once defend your teammate and properly give it a go and help him secure peace. Because if it, if they wanted to get it as badly as they supposedly said they did, or not supposedly said they did, they did say it, but if they meant it as much as they claim, then it didn't really seem like they were that bothered about it come the end of it. Because I mean, Maxi Team Radio like, did he do it? No. Ah, shame. But didn't really care about it. And no point did the strategy seem like they were going to try and help Paris in any way there. It was just kind of, yeah, good luck. Have fun with that. We don't really care about that, actually. And I just think it would have been so easy for them to do, as we said earlier, most dominant season for them in the best car that they've ever had. And let's face it, it doesn't take much to catch Ferrari out. And yet they lost to Ferrari. So, again, bit of a shot in the foot there from them. So that is why they are in the bin. I don't think Max could have really done anything. In the he could have literally, they... Perez could have gone up the inside of him in turn one like he was trying to. Max could have given him the space to do that and at least from the first half seen if he could have pulled out a gap, defended a bit. Because yeah, he's got literally nothing to lose or gain from this, from just letting but this that, happen. He could, so That wouldn't have then stopped Red Bull giving Perez a two-stop strategy and Verstappen a one. And but again, could have swapped that round ahead of it and why not orchestrate it for me and Perez's favour for a change? The guy works hard enough. I don't think this is on Verstappen. I think it's on Red no, Bull. No, I'm saying it's so on Red Bull as a whole. I'm saying the whole yeah. thing. But Verstappen is part of that and at no point did he really seem to be like, oh, come on, tell Checo to keep up with me and I can try and help him a bit then. Or I'll give him the but toe a little couldn't... bit of this kind of thing. <laughs> but then surely then it's for Perez to keep up with Verstappen and he didn't. Well, because they're in the same driver league, are they? I'm just saying they sucked him on strategy and Max didn't exactly do anything to help him and didn't exactly sound too cut up about it when they got over there, which I'm not surprised at, but it's just, oh, we're going to do everything we can to help Checo. Proceed to do nothing to help Checo. I agree with the Red Bull bit, but I don't agree with the Verstappen bit because I don't think there's only so much Verstappen can do. Door open, turn one, let him pass, off you go. Jobs are scrubbed He's got nothing to lose by doing it. It's exactly the same as Brazil. You don't need any more points. You don't need any more wins. You don't even need to be there. 
This is the so, real thing. It is that case of Max had nothing to lose and precisely nothing really to gain. And I don't know why they didn't do more, but equally at the same time, he's got his reasons. He's always laid down the law and I don't, I think they're whatever too afraid to, whatever those reasons are, I'm still desperate to find out. I, I, it, it's odd they did it, but at the same time, I'm they're not just surprised, preserving I'm the just status quo. That's all. Yeah, so, they're just preserving the status quo, which I can understand to an extent when you're looking to try and build a competitive and balanced team coming into it next season. It would have, it would have hurt nothing on their end to do it and would have meant a lot to Perez and could have potentially keep them on side for next year. If they implode next year into a civil war of some kind at some point, you've got to think this race didn't help. Yeah. Especially one week after Brazil, we're like, okay, no, we don't actually mean all this bullshit we just said. We'll help you again next week. Next week comes. Oh, you wanted us to mean that. Oh, well, actually. But anyway, that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to go on to you, Jesse, and your spinner, which I think is unfair because it's not his fault. I'm not talking about the retirement. The retirement is just that Alpine being that Alpine. Well, then write Alpine reason. down. Don't write Alonso down. No, because he had a fairly lacklustre performance. He drove as though he just didn't really care, which I think he is was quite helping fair. Vettel out. He didn't yeah, want to hurt I think. Him. I think he just didn't want to overtake Vettel. He literally leaned into the cockpit at the start of the race when I won't attack you on lap one because he wanted to make sure he did donuts then and Alpine couldn't even give him a decent car to do that because it blew up. Mm. You, no just, you, kept seeing, you kept seeing Alonso whenever he hit back the GRS range of Vettel just sort of getting out of the slipstream so that he wasn't overtaking him. He, yeah, okay, perhaps I've misjudged this one, but the fact yes, of the matter is that... <laughs> Okay, it was actually a very anti-Alonso thing for Alonso to do. Blame Stroll. Put Stroll in this bloody section for being a dick and not getting right, right, more points. It's been from the race Stroll for not being a Thank good you. teammate to Sebastian Vettel. We'll call that, we'll call it quits on my one there. Ellie May, <laughs> who's yours? Uh, mine is Lewis Hamilton because it's, well, as I've said previously, it's his worst year in an F1 season. First season, he hasn't had a pole or a win. And it's his first mechanical failure in years. And if I've got this right, I think it's Austrian, the Austrian GP in 2018, where he had a fuel pressure problem, which was also, I think, the last time Mercedes double DNF'd. So it was just a pretty lacklustre race for Hamilton as well. And just, yeah, not yeah. great. Yeah. <laughs> I can't even. <laughs> no, it's, it's a fair spinner, to be fair. There could, there could have been so much more. And I don't think luck nor. He, nor his drive really were there for it he he seemed to personally lack a little bit going into it but also crucially his his car's approach to it there was an interesting message on the team radio of I think she's tired as they retired the car sort of said it all really he'd, he'd run that car ragged this entire season long you've got to look at the the amount he was throwing through that car at Silverstone where you have that brilliant hit so you've got to give double them overtake. credit though considering that George's DNF in Silverstone obviously wasn't a mechanical failure or reliability that was mm. neat. Um, so Mercedes still must have the most reliable car on the grid, surely. Yeah, um, by a, yeah. By so a long is, shot. But, and, it, and it is interesting to see what that means for next year when you have, at the moment, two extra races and how that can play into it. If you can make a car last almost 22 races with minimal kind of, I can say minimal damage as a whole, mm. then... That's good and shows you where you need to improve, but I don't know how you eat that extra little bit out when you only need to like aim for it if we're doing an extra five Grand Prix. Because again, you have six sprints next year, so kind of if you add all of that up, does that roughly get there then? Mm, but how many grid drops did they ever take for things like uh, pieces outside of their engine pool and parts pool? I not that many. But no. Definitely a lot. No. Uh, definitely a lot less than last year. Yeah, a lot less than last year. A lot less than many of the other teams, which suggests that they've been quite efficient in the way they've run the car. And I think that could prove to be a big thing as we go into these more endurance-oriented seasons with six sprint races and far more races on the calendar as a whole. That, if anything, could be the make or break. I think we could go back to the very 1980s thing of the winner is the person whose car makes it to the end of the goddamn season, not necessarily the person with the most points at that, at that instance. It's going to be exciting in that regard. Childishly, I would be myself if I'm an Alpine. Yes, if I was getting oh, into no. the seat that oh, Alonso no. had just vacated, I would be worried. Um, yeah. Yeah. I was, <laughs> yeah, I was literally just going to agree with what you said, Jesse, in that perhaps Hamilton would do a Keki Rosberg. Mm, yeah, win the championship with perhaps well, one win to his name. 
Hamilton with a big moustache would be quite good, I think. I don't think he can grow one as per that driver's conference a few years back. Mm, no. Yeah, he <laughs> usually goes for like the thin, really thin line of an or like slightly stubbly. Yeah. Perhaps 2023 will be Lando Norris's year to finally start growing facial hair. You might get puberty. He might do. Who's going to get puberty first, Piastri or, or Norris? <laughs> nice. Um, UP. Mid, midway through a race, Piastri's voice just gets suddenly deeper on the team race. Yeah. It's happening, boys. It's happening. The worst thing possible for Alpha Tauri. They design a small car and Yuki gets a growth spurt. <laughs> <laughs> a, his race suit is now swinging around his ankles, and B, he no longer fits in the car. <laughs> Oh, I want that. Anyway, we've got one more spinner to go. So, Manana, who is your spinner for this weekend? Hmm, I'm going to have to say Lewis Hamilton. I think he kind of, and this is something we've never seen coming from him, but I think he kind of sabotaged himself, which would be a first, because he just wanted to get that win so badly that he just, like, got the three warnings and was so close to getting a five-second penalty until eventually his car kind of stopped working so i think those I don't would be know if it two. was him sabotaging or if the team would just it seemed like the after the success of brazil the the team again very rare for mercedes to do this anyway but they fumbled a bit anyway so even if it wasn't hamilton it was then mercedes themselves and very uncharacteristic and at least it's here i suppose in a season where it doesn't matter too much in comparison to every other year but it's still very odd to see and not not great either but uh and again that that you wonder how much floor damage you did really get as well at the beginning of the race and how much that yeah. came into play yeah i agree but i mean the track limits was 100 percent. oh yeah that, no definitely that bit i can't defend <laughs> but yeah yes. so i meant more like in that sense let's say like eventually he retired his car that was a shame and like they said it was a first retirement of Mercedes of the whole season like what a shame and had to happen on the last race yeah but, I guess with, yeah. aside from I was going to say you saw in Spa with the contact with Alonso not a he still managed to keep going there it wasn't too bad and you obviously saw George out pretty early in Silverstone but apart from that they have been absolutely bulletproof in terms of reliability and DNFs this season and it just shows that as as much of a problem as the rest of the car but at least they don't have to worry too much on that and they can just keep doing that one so they're clearly doing something right and hopefully next year they can come back into it a bit more and at the very least keep ferrari on their toes if not red bull yeah no i think they're gonna come back really 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 strong next season especially with george russell and well, we'll see what Ferrari, what happens with Ferrari, sorry, because I think that Ferrari is also going to come really strong, especially with all those rumors about Mattia Binotto getting replaced. So we'll see what happens. So we'll move on from winners and spinners to the overall winners and spinners of the season at this point, because we, of course, wrapped up our 22 race calendar. The last time we'll be seeing a calendar that short for quite some time, I fear. Um, so we'll move on to Constructors Countdown. And, well, Williams has come home plum last with eight points. Alpha Tauri take P9, which seems low for them. It is. They did shit. Hang on, you've written that in there. <laughs> I have written that in. <laughs> and I've completely anchormanned my way into it by just reading what's on the screen. Haas do all right on 37 points in P8. Alfa Romeo and Aston Martin tie on 55 points. The Italo-Swiss outfit beating the Silverstone team on merit of Bottas's P5 in Imola. McLaren were left with... P5, unable to catch Alpine's P4. P3 go to, goes to Mercedes, the first time since 2012 that they haven't been in the top two constructors. P2 goes to Ferrari, and with a 205 point lead, Red Bull take the title. On the driver's standings, Hulkenberg has nil points this year, but this could change. Not this year, it won't. What do you mean, not this year? Well, this will change next year, Timo. Get with yes, the vibe of what I'm writing. Not this year. Yeah, I appreciate not this year he's not going to get any points. We might get someone with like a home driving license. I don't know. Anyway, Hulkenberg has nil points this year, but this could change next year. De Vries has had a Better. dunking and two points out. Oh, yeah, wrote I, that. I, I wrote that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am very tired. De Vries has had a dunking, of course, in the Yaz Marina and two points to his title challenge. Latifi I'm just in... thinking of the potential I could have had there if I changed one letter. 
Yeah. Um, Latifi in P20 also has two points, but of course, with some higher positions across the season, outscores De Vries. Albon takes P19 with four points. Joe sits in P18 with six. Not too bad for a rookie in a relatively eh car. Uh, doubling six for 12 seasons in P17 and Yuki Tsunoda also tied on 12 points is Mick Schumacher, who leads on account of his P6 in Austria. Yuki's best result is a P7 in Imola. Stroll takes 15th with 18 points to his name, while future Alpine driver Pierre Gasly sits in 14th hoping for a better season next year. Magnussen has 25 points in P13. Vettel rounds out his final championship in 12th place, narrowly missing out to a hard-pressing Daniel Ricciardo, who nabbed 11th. After a rough riding season, Bottas takes 10th place, making little progress since his strong opening quarter of the year. P9 goes to Fernando Alonso, 11 points shy of Ocon in P8, the only second driver ever to outscore the Spaniard as his teammate, ignoring the year he spent at Minardi against Tarso Marquez, where neither driver scored, but Tarso placed higher. Like I said, P8 Ocon, who I have a hunch will be placing a bit higher with Alpine next year. P7 went to Lando Norris, who scored six P7s across the season and a further P7 in the Sao Paulo sprint, so seven P7s. P6 went to Lewis Hamilton, his lowest season result to date. P5 was awarded to Carlos Sainz, snatching the title of Lewis following his DNF despite a tumultuous season packed with reliability problems six retirements across the year car number 55 has scooped up 246 points P4 was awarded to George Russell with 275 points he like Ocon falls into the small pool of drivers to have ever beaten Lewis in equal machinery Nico Rosberg famously in 2016 and Jensen Button Ocon in didn't beat Lewis in the same machinery Jesse that's just nonsense no but like Ocon beats his teammate in same machinery why do you have to interrupt me when I'm on a flow? For this exact reason. <sighs> Into the top three, P3 went to Sergio Perez. This year marks his best season in Formula One. This season, he's scored more podiums than his seven previous seasons in the sport, with his win rate this year equaling that of the rest of his career. P2 was taken by Charles Leclerc in a year where he hasn't had to fight just Max Verstappen, but also the Ferrari pit wall and engineers. Despite this, 2022 has been his best year in the sport. And romping home in P1, well clear of his competition, having driven a season that was marred only by early reliability issues, it's Max Verstappen. I have the inside scoop of where Mitch Schumacher is going next year. Ooh. Is it back to the Audi catalogue? Unfortunately not. And he's not going on cruises either. He's actually doing synchronised driving with Nicholas Latifi. <laughs> because bit- that, that pirouette was a 10 out of 10. It, they should probably go I should like have competitive got more drifting. fancy points for that, I feel. That's all I'm saying on that one. You should have got more fantasy points for it, yes, but you, it wasn't an option in fantasy racing. And also, I, they should definitely go into... So like you need to change drifting. up for next year. That's, all I've, that's, that's, that's what I think. They need to add bonus points for style. They might do or we run our own fantasy season, which I really don't want to have to try and set up a spreadsheet for that. Um, should we rate drivers' spins and crashes? I feel that could be a good piece of off-season content. I compile a video of all of the year's crashes and spins and you know which song you need to use for it right we're spinning like a ballerina you spin me right round dead or alive there we go the second one there we go anyway with the countdown of constructors and drivers out of the way, we'll move on to another championship that was wrapped up prematurely, our predictions, which, of course, we found out in Brazil that Ellie May had taken the title for pretty comprehensively. And in Abu Dhabi, neither Timo nor I were able to get close with no one scoring points at all. Um, so pretty panicked. Really thought- Me now that I do beat you and get second place, though, overall. Uh, Have I done what Mercedes weren't able to? Yeah, yeah, you, you lunched me. You you got me by one point. So all, you honestly, need, baby. all you need. I honestly thought I was going to get points for Sebastian Vettel winning. You yeah. Are you high over the weekend? or I, mean, I can give you a point for one driver of the day. It makes no difference at this point. She's already it won. Makes it, yeah, she's already seven <laughs> points clear of you and a further eight clear of me. So, I mean, yeah. Uh, 28 points to Ellie May, 21 to Timo, 20 to me, 17 to the guest. Um, yeah. However you cut it, Ellie May wins. So. I'm very happy with my second place, though, I've got to say. Because Ellie May, yeah, she went and did a Red Bull and romped her head. But, you know, I'm going to get that extra satisfaction from beating the man who took it more seriously than I did. Yeah, that's annoying. <laughs> I'm quite glad to win something 
I'm not sure when the last time I won something. So this is this is nice. Yeah, wear it with pride. We'll get you a medal and we can give it to you at the big quiz. We'll oh, like they gave that a crypto medal in the sprint race. That, no, that weird medal they gave to Max yeah. just at the final race as part. Yeah. Of, I'm fairly certain this is part of Mohammed Ben Salim's sort of ongoing challenges to get himself on TV more by simply it's thinking of new and inventive ways. It is oh, absolute pish. I'm sorry. Well, it, it's like. We're not going to start it right at the start of next year. We're going to do it for the last race of the season. Why now? Yeah. I can understand them doing it for the sprint, so you've got something to commemorate having won a sprint race. That's fair enough. They're usually a bit odd. Doesn't seem quite right, especially when they gave out laurels at Monza last year, wasn't it? But yeah, out all of them last year and just looked shit then as well. Yeah, but then just sort of... It's, it's sort of like going up to the podium and gently cupping Max's testes. It was just such a weird move. I would kind like, of prefer that just because I'd love to see the reaction. <laughs> just sort of unzipping his waist, slipping a hand uh, in and just going, uh. well done. Not shaking his hand, just sort of give him a gentle sort of, just a gentle examination, just like you're clear for another year. And <laughs> it's just a weird move from the head of the FIA. I think he's only doing this for his own personal clout at this point, so he might as well go up there. Imagine just, that at the Qatar Grand yeah. next year, just goes along, cuts Maxi Gorsi. Oh, you're not allowed to do that. He'd be having his hand cut off for that one, certainly. Anyway, um, before we get into a very weird territory that we've somehow never strayed into before on this podcast, cupping Max for Sappen's testicles. Um, I can't believe it's taken what, so what long. What you think about in your own time is your business. <laughs> I assume they're quite smooth. He has a lawnmower 3.0. Manscaped.com if you want to sponsor us. We'll just keep saying that Max Verstappen uses the Manscaped lawnmower 3.0. We don't want to get until him to sponsor. We want to sponsor for ourselves. No, but because it's fake, eventually they'll pay us to stop saying it. I think I think Ben will, will do it before us just so we don't say he's cupping Max Verstappen's balls, to be honest. Yeah, possibly true. We'll get Mohamed Ben Salam to pay us to stop slandering him with groping Max Stafford. Anyway, we're getting lost. Uh, Fantasy F1 review. And well, it's been fun, but I guess it, now it's time for us to put our hands in our pockets and chill out for the Freddo Frog that's been on the line for our Fantasy League. It's been a fun battle at the top with a lot of place changes. Abu Dhabi gave us another mixed bag of results. This week's winner is Dan C, my mate from uni. 19 points clear of Hanson's Ryan Braun GP. I came home third, tied with Megan Maurer, a friend of the show, on 200 points. And in an unexpected fifth place Timo with the podcast team. oh it, damn, just for this I, race I, yeah no 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 I was expecting that overall Jesus Christ no but I was not expecting the pod oh it was the podcast team okay that might be more so I was going to say how shit did everyone else do if my team got no your team did not do very well at all in fact I should be able to pull it up I know I've got the tab open it, it is. I, I say Ellie May for this for your benefit I decided as a tribute because I knew I wasn't going to win overall anyway I decided I'd go for all the drivers that aren't going to be there next year plus one extra. So I had Latifi, I had Ricardo, I had Mick, and who is the fourth one that I had? You had Hamilton, Ricardo, Latifi, Vettel, Schumacher. Oh, Vettel, yes. I, mean, I, thought, I, thought, I thought I'll add a driver in you, mate. That'll do great. Hamilton. Then. You scored 52 Be- points. Terrible. Absolute, absolutely terrible. Do um, better. He, he should do better. It was next for a good, good cause. I was doing it because I couldn't do it next year with any of them, so... Yeah. Anyway, so how do things look for the season as a whole? Well, uh, we've had 21 entries, uh, but there can be only one winner. In fifth place, it's Hanson's Ryan Braun GP with 3,807 points. In fourth, it's me with Jaffa Cake Racing bagging 3,883 points. In third, it's Alan G's Team 1 on 3,897. In second, with 3,923, it's me again with BRT Yamaha. And with a winning margin of just 52 points, it was tight at the top considering how many points you've been accrue over the season. It's Alex H. Nicely done, and uh, we'll get your Freddo to you in the post. Timo, you came 17th and 20th overall. Do I get a Freddo? Result. Like you said, you're, you can either be gently cupped by Mohamed Ben Salam, yeah. or we can give you a medal. I hate to break it to you, Jesse, but Eddie May, um, as far as I'm aware, doesn't have testicles. I was about to say, I don't have balls. Okay, then you get the little medal at the big quiz. I think I'll I'm so glad medal. that's what you said. You did go in a different direction. <laughs> yes, you're getting a little medal at the quiz. <laughs> Anyway, um, I'm not being your lawyers <laughs> when you get sued. 
sued for defaming the defamation pencil i am if you're listening it's to this right. in court this is all ellie may's idea no matter it's what right. she says he doesn't listen to this i'm sure he, he's got better things to do probably like what think of medal ideas for a grand yes. prix come on yeah, jesse he's, he's not finding a podcast with 52 regular listeners and going i'll see what these fellas are up to this weekend oh anyway what a week uh, to start listening We'll move on to the non-race news. And obviously after the race, it's uh, we fall straight into post-season testing. We have young driver tests, we have tyre tests, we have all sorts of things going on still at Yas Marina. And um, it's already begun with drivers out in black and white helmets, like prototype cars on the road. I always love it when you see them in like, their, their prototype testing helmets and grey race suits, because uh, Pierre Gasly was uh, getting a seat fit for the Alpine earlier today. And he had this it sort of... It just looks like all the rejects from the stage. It, they do, yeah, like badly badly matured sticks. They haven't quite come into full white yet. So it's quite fun. Um, but the one interesting thing to come out of it was an interview with Otmar Zafnauer, who said, I'm happy that our driver pairing with Esteban and Pierre is better than it would have been if we had won that case, that case being the one against or for Oscar Piastri. Uh, more experienced, still young, and time will tell, but I think faster is Otmar Zafnauer's words about Pierre Gasly. So spicy talk from Alpine already which i like it's gonna be interesting because obviously mclaren have a good bit of work to do if they want to get back to where they were last year never mind improving beyond that whereas lp they just need to stop their cars from going boom and then they're sorted and Mm. oscar very good but hasn't driven really anything this year lando good when he concentrates and needs a bit more of that i think Ocon, decent, but Gasly could be a make-or-break year next year for him because I just wonder, and got that win in Monza, would he be rated as highly as he is, considering that, well, he wasn't at Red Bull for very long. He didn't do very well at all there. He didn't get on the podium once at all, and I just wonder if... He hadn't had that one to win. Would he even be, have been in the conversations for it, or would someone like Nick have got the seat instead? Because it would have been worth more of the risk than Gasly, who has been around for longer, whereas Nick would have been young, up and coming talent, or someone else completely for that matter. Maybe Ricardo. You just go. I just I, wonder. I will say no because, despite if you take away that win in Monza, Pierre Gasly still had a very good season in 2020. All I'll say to that is. There was 2020, though. We've had two whole seasons since then, and you are only as good as your last race. Yeah, he didn't do badly in 2021. He got no, two? but at the same he time, worthy one. of... I'm uh, just saying, pe- people with less talent have gotten better seats for less. Yeah. But I mean, so I'm just... I, wanna, I think you'll be very telling next year that now he's finally out of all this Red Bull stuff what he will actually be capable of. Yeah, this will be the litmus test. This is going to go, it's either going to go really well or really badly. I don't think there's a middle ground where it's good enough for him. If he's on par with Ocon, I'm calling that a win, basically. If he can be close to Ocon within, say, 20 points by the end of the season, I think that's a fairly good result to have a team that he's never driven for before, getting used to a setup that he won't have driven for. You massive backfiring within 20 points means he's zero. Ocon's got 20 and helping to turn the back of the constructor championship. Hey, I'm still correct. That's all I'm saying. It's really upsetting that Ocon's P19 in the championship, but I'm still correct on that point. But yeah, uh, Gasly's got three podiums to his name. One of them, of course, being that win at Monza. He came third in Azerbaijan in 2021 last year and second in Brazil 2019. So he can put a car on the podium and... The only thing, and I'm only saying it to be devil's advocate and to be that person, but those three races were all unusual. Yes, they were, to be fair. And also this season, he did not do as well as he has done previously. Um, 2019, 7th, 2020, 10th, 2021, 9th. So within the top 10, generally speaking, 2022, 2022, 14th. But again, you look at his performance against teammates. He's consistently outperformed his teammates. We well, should a which constant is, carousel of drivers that's fairly consistent. Okay, ignoring 20, the first half of 2019, <laughs> yes, he's constantly outperformed teammates. It's been a bit of a carousel, but the fact of the matter is that's how you look at the performance of the car is look at how good one driver is against the other. And he's he's pulled something out of that machinery every year. And again, Azerbaijan this year, fifth place, he's been 
which is a decent finish. And again, I something that one of twenty two races. Yeah, but it's something. You got majority Alpha of Tauri... the points you got for the entire year in one race. But it's something that's that like Alpha saying Tauri... yes, they did really well this year because of that fifth place in Bahrain. But he did better than his teammate, and he did something that Carl really shouldn't have been able to do. And I think that's a key. Element I can't there. defend Yuki because I don't know what's going on in his head. But I have two things to say in the in an argument to how you said yes, his podiums have been as a result of crazy races, but you still have to be there to get those podiums. Oh, no, that's fine. That's fine. Which you have to have driven my, through the crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And my other thing is, it's it's not out of disrespect for Ocon because I think Ocon has had a very good season, oh, go and I do, go and I do on, believe though. he's a very good driver. Go on, but though. Alonso has had a lot of bad luck this season and a lot of DNFs, and I think without that, Alonso would have beaten him. So I'm not sure we've really oh, yeah. seen a representative Ocon this year. So that's fair. It's hard to see whether it's going to be that representative. Alonso reckons he lost somewhere around 70 to 80 points this year but due to Alpine reliability, which is quite believable. I'd need to sort of sit down and properly pull it apart. This is, again, something for the season review to look at as we sort of pull apart each driver's year more accurately. But week. Yeah, we have one week to get this all done, plus a quiz to write, plus a magazine to produce. I'll get it done somewhere. Anyway, that seems like a perfect point to end our review of the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix on... Manena, we'll turn back to you because you've sort of been here through the edit because of the unique way that time zones and everyone having jobs works. Um, Where can the people find you? Right. So I'm basically on every social network, literally. (laughs) Spotify, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, everything. TikTok. And it's the same everywhere. A girl talks F1. And if anybody wants to follow in Spanish or learn more Spanish, just on YouTube, it's a girl talks F1X. And Timo, where can the people find you? Well, Jesse, you can find me over on, on the podcast, the Nacho RX podcast, Paddock Sorority, Paddock Passion, Instagram, and Is It Fast? Where can the people find you, Ellie Mae? Um, waiting on social media to finally see Danny Rick in those Red Bull overalls. That's that's fair. Not waiting for Mohamed Ben Salim to give you a gentle cupping. <laughs> Not yet. It's Not second yet. on the list. It's a close second. Um, yeah, That's going to be the opening stinger for the podcast, isn't it? I'm Jesse? really trying to think of what the title's <laughs> going to be for this, and I don't think we're allowed to title a YouTube video Mohammed Ben Salim. The Undercut Jimmy Cup Cup Podcast. It. It's sort of like a way of ending, have I got news for you? We should start doing that. We should. What, just doing, oh, have I got F1 news for you? Bit. Oh, if this is the answer, Seems what is like the to question? See in the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. <laughs> Uh, anyway, Jesse, where can people find you finally? Uh, before I am arrested on charges of um, insulting Mohammed Ben Salayam, uh, you can find me writing for Classic Car Weekly, and you can buy copies of that in all good news agents and shops. And you can also find me on Instagram and Twitter as at Jesse on Cars. And if all else fails, just look for me in some sort of sound, um, Emirati prison where I've been locked up for defamatory statements against the head of the FIA. That's all we've got time for this week. We'll be back soon with a review of the Feeder Series action from Abu Dhabi and a big season review, plus a quiz. Mm-hmm.